welcome. Be sure to like and subscribe for more scary stories. Or I will come for you. Today's stories are recent writings from my personal archive. Sick and disturbing, just the way you like them. Story number one. My new rug by the curator. I never thought something like this would happen to me. I'm just a regular person, you know. I work a nine to five desk job, come home, watch some Netflix, maybe order a pizza on the weekends. Totally normal. Or at least I thought I was normal until that day. It started a few months ago. I was bored at work, just browsing the internet to kill time. I ended up falling down a rabbit hole reading about the human psyche and all these weird experiments that have been done over the years. Stuff like the Stanford Prison Experiment, MK Ultra, all those creepy CIA mind control projects. It got me really interested, so I started digging deeper. That's when I found it. A dark web forum discussing the unexplored depth of the human condition sounded right up my alley so I made an account and started reading the posts a lot of it was just the usual dark web nonsense illegal weapons drugs hitmen for hire that sort of thing but there were also these really disturbing posts about people conducting their own experiments on unwilling subject stuff that made the government projects look tame I know I probably shouldn't have, but I got sucked in. I started responding to the posts, asking questions, trying to learn more. And eventually, one of the forum members reached out to me directly. Said they had an opportunity they thought I'd be interested in. Being the morbidly curious idiot that I am, I took the bait. They told me about this video archive they had access to, filled with footage of these experiments being carried out. And get this, they said I could view the videos, but only if I agreed to keep it all a secret. Of course, I said yes. I mean, how often does someone offer you a chance to peek behind the veil of humanity's darkest impulses? So they sent me a link told me it would take me to the video archive. When I clicked on it, I was taken to this completely black web page. No menu, no navigation, just a void of blackness. And right in the middle was a single hyperlink, also black. It was so subtle, I almost missed it. But my curiosity got the better of me, and I clicked on it. The page that loaded was almost as empty as the last one. But this time, there were three video files, all labeled my new rug, part one, two, and three. I hesitated for a second, knowing that whatever I was about to see was probably going to be horrific. But I had come this far, so I steeled myself and clicked on the first video. The footage started with a close-up on a man's face. He was clearly terrified, his eyes wide and darting around the room. Suddenly, a pair of hands came into frame, holding a large scalpel. The man started screaming and struggling, but he was firmly strapped down to what looked like a surgical table. The hands with the scalpel moved down to the man's chest, and I watched in morbid fascination as the skin was slowly peeled away. It was a meticulous, methodical process, with the person performing the procedure taking great care to separate the layers of flesh without tearing or damaging the skin. They started at the edge of the man's chest, carefully inserting the tip of the scalpel under the skin and gently working it along the natural seams and contours of the body. With each controlled incision, a thin strip of skin peeled back, revealing the raw, pinkish-red tissue beneath. The man's screams became more agonized with each inch of skin that was removed, his face contorting in absolute agony. I could see the muscles in his neck straining as he thrashed against the restraints, tendons standing out in sharp relief. His eyes were wide and bloodshot, pupils dilated in sheer terror. The sound of his cries was utterly primal, 
a visceral expression of the unimaginable pain he was experiencing. As the person continued their horrific work, I noticed the careful, deliberate way they handled the skin. They would pause occasionally to gently smooth out any wrinkles or folds, ensuring the piece they were removing remained intact and undamaged. It was almost surgical in its precision, as if they were performing some twisted form of anatomical preservation rather than outright torture. The skin peeled away in long, continuous strips, slowly revealing the glistening layers of muscle and fat underneath. I found myself mesmerized by this spectacle, unable to look away despite the overwhelming nausea and revulsion I felt. There was an almost clinical quality to the way the person operated, as if they were conducting a delicate medical procedure rather than sadistically flaying a living, breathing human being. The methodical, almost clinical nature of their actions only served to heighten the sheer horror of the situation, making it all the more difficult to process. By the time the first layer had been completely peeled off, the man's chest was a raw, red mess of exposed muscle and tissue. I could see the individual fibers contracting and pulsing as he continued to scream and struggle against his restraints. It was a horrifying, almost hypnotic sight. The video then cut to the second part, which showed the process continuing down the man's torso and limbs. The person performing the surgery was incredibly skilled, carefully removing the skin in one continuous piece like they were skinning an animal. I watched in a mixture of fascination and revulsion as the man's body was slowly transformed into a grotesque, flayed husk. By the end of the second video, the entire exterior of the man's body had been completely stripped of skin where there had once been smooth, supple flesh, now only a raw, red mass of exposed muscle, tendons, and veins remain. It was as if the person performing this twisted procedure had meticulously removed every last inch of the man's skin, leaving him utterly vulnerable and disfigured. The sight was truly horrifying to behold. The man's body was now nothing more than a quivering, living, anatomical model. A grotesque display of the inner workings of the human form laid bare for all to see. I could see each individual muscle fiber contracting and twitching beneath the glistening layers of tissue, the tendons flexing and straining as the man struggled futilely against his restraints. The network of blood vessels snaked across the exposed surface, pulsing with every frantic heartbeat. The man's eyes were wide with unbridled terror, the white stark against the raw redness of his flayed face. Tears streamed down his cheeks in an endless cascade, mingling with the fluid that oozed from the ravaged skin. He stared directly at the camera, his gaze pleading for mercy, for the torture to end. But there was no compassion, no pity in that unblinking lens. Only the cold, indifferent recording of his agony. I found myself unable to tear my eyes away from the screen, transfixed by the sheer, visceral horror of what I was witnessing. The man's suffering was palpable, his anguished cries and ragged, labored breathing cutting through me like a knife. It was as if I could feel his pain, the unbearable sting of having his very flesh ripped away, leaving him exposed and vulnerable. The person responsible for this atrocity had stripped a man of his humanity, reducing him to nothing more than a living, quivering specimen, a testament to the darkest depths of the human psyche. And the fact that I was now privy to this unspeakable act, that I had willingly borne witness to such cruelty filled me with a sense of dread and revulsion that I couldn't begin to articulate. I felt tainted, corrupted by the knowledge of what my fellow human beings were capable of, and I knew that I would never be the same again. I don't know how long I stared at the screen, unable to look away, 
It felt like my mind was fracturing, trying to comprehend the sheer depravity of what I had just witnessed. I wanted to vomit, to scream, to curl up in a ball and forget this ever happened. But I couldn't. The images were seared into my brain, an indelible mark of humanity's capacity for cruelty. Eventually, I managed to close the browser and stumble away from my desk. I couldn't focus on work for the rest of the day, my thoughts consumed by the video archive and the unspeakable things it contained. I tried to tell myself it was all just a sick joke, a hoax, but deep down I knew the truth. Those videos were real, and the knowledge of their existence has haunted me ever since. I haven't been able to sleep properly, plagued by nightmares of that skinned man, his eyes pleading for mercy. I keep wondering who he was, how he ended up in that place, and what kind of monster could do that to another human being. And the worst part is, I know I'll never get those answers, because I'm too afraid to go back, to try and find out more. Sometimes, I think about going to the authorities, telling them what I've seen. But what good would that do? They'd never believe me. And even if they did, what could they possibly do? The video archive is on the dark web, impossible to trace or take down. No, I'm trapped with this knowledge, forced to carry the weight of it on my own. I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm going crazy like I'll never be able to unsee those horrible images. All I know is that I can't stop thinking about that rug made from human skin. It's like a scar on my mind, a constant reminder of the darkness that lurks in the world. And I'm terrified that one day I'll become a part of it. Story number two. I've been working at my family's butcher shop for over 30 years now. It's a small place, but we've built up a loyal customer base over the decades. My dad started the shop back in the 70s, and it's been my life's work to keep it going. Things were going well for a long time. We had a great reputation for quality meats and personal service. The customers loved coming in and chatting with us about their cooking and getting recommendations. It was a real community hub. But then a few years back, things started to change. There was a serious meat shortage that hit our whole region. Prices for beef, pork, chicken, everything just skyrocketed. People had to cut back, and a lot of our regular customers started going to the big chain grocery stores instead. Our sales plummeted, and I was really struggling to keep the shop afloat. I remember one day, my neighbor Mike came in, and he could see the worry on my face. Hey, buddy, what's got you so down? He asked. I told him about the business troubles, how we were barely breaking even these days. Mike shook his head and said, Damn, that's rough, man. Hey, you know what you should do. Start butchering up some of those annoying customers that come in here complaining about the prices. Turn him into sausage or something. Make a killing. He let out this big, booming laugh, like it was the funniest joke in the world. I forced out a chuckle, but the truth is, I couldn't stop thinking about what he said. As the weeks went on, and the financial pressure mounted, that idea started to seem less and less crazy to me. I mean, it's not like anyone would miss a few of the more unpleasant regulars, right? What the fuck? Why was I even contemplating this? There is no way I could ever go through with it. Over the coming days, that thought would not leave the forefront of my mind. Day by day, our stock decreased, and the business wasn't making enough money to replenish it. Our situation was getting really serious now. I had heard about something called the Dark Web. It was apparently a haven for drugs. Murder for hire, but more importantly, cannibals. Maybe cannibal forums had some insights for me. Jesus, really? I can't believe what I'm saying. 
Despite the utter revulsion of my actions, I stumbled across a forum called the Human Chef. My god, the images and conversation going on here was on another level. At the top of the forum, though, I noticed a pinned thread. All I saw was the word schematics. I clicked it. Bingo. It was exactly what I was looking for. A detailed, hand-illustrated breakdown of how to butcher the human body for cooking. Fuck me. These guys didn't let anything go to waste. This will help my margins, too. I retired to my bed after spending two hours breaking down the diagram. You can do this, I said to myself. You will do this, or your family will be out on the street. There's no fucking way I'm letting that happen. The next day, one of our problematic customers, Mrs. Henderson, came in complaining about our outrageous prices again. I invited her to the back to show her something. As soon as we got back there, I grabbed her from behind and clamped a hand over her mouth to muffle her screams. With my other hand, I quickly drew a sharp butcher's knife across her throat in one swift motion. Blood sprayed out in a horrific geyser, spattering all over my clothes and the surrounding area. She collapsed to the ground, gurgling and choking on her own blood. I watched dispassionately as the life drained from her eyes. My heart was racing. The instant regret I felt was overwhelming, but I had to do this for my family. Once she had stopped moving, I got to work. I stripped off her clothes and hung the body upside down from a meat hook, allowing the remaining blood to drain out. Then I started the grisly process of butchering the corpse. With practiced hands, I skinned the body and carefully removed all the internal organs. I carved the muscle tissue off the bones in neat, even strips, just as I would with any livestock. The sounds of the bone saw, cutting through her joints, and the dull thud of the meat cleaver were the only noises in the room, aside from the occasional drip of blood. I made sure to mince some of the meat extra fine for use in sausages and ground beef. The rest I packaged up neatly, labeling the cuts just as I would any other order. By the time I was done, you honestly couldn't tell the difference between Mrs. Henderson's flesh and our regular meat stock. I'll admit, I was a nervous wreck waiting for the next customer. But when old Mr. Gibbons came in asking for some ground beef, I confidently wrapped up a package and handed it to him, fresh cut from our latest shipment. Smells delicious as always, Mario, he said with a smile. You really are the best butcher in town. I breathed a huge sigh of relief as he paid and left. It had worked. Nobody had any idea what they were really taking home. Over the next few weeks, I started targeting more of our problem customers, the ones who were always complaining, the ones who would try to haggle me down on prices. It became almost routine. I would lure them to the back, overpower them, and then swiftly slit their throats before they even knew what was happening. The actual killings were always quick and efficient. I made sure to slice a major artery for an instant, painless death. Then I would hang the bodies upside down and drain them of blood before beginning the gruesome process of butchery. I have to admit, after the first couple of times, I started to almost enjoy this twisted little ritual. There was a morbid satisfaction in expertly breaking down a human body, just as I had done countless times with livestock. The sounds, the smells, the feel of the meat under my knife. It was all oddly thrilling. Business started booming again. People were raving about how good our meats tasted, how tender and flavorful. I started making more money than I ever had before. It was a total turnaround. Of course, I had to be careful. I didn't want to draw any unwanted attention or suspicion. So I made sure to only target people who wouldn't be immediately missed. Loners, transients, P3 
people on the fringes of society, and I kept my kills limited to just a few per month to avoid anyone noticing a pattern. Things were going great for a while. I was making a killing, no pun intended, and no one was the wiser. But then, one day, a new customer came in that I just couldn't resist. It was a young woman, probably in her mid-twenties. Gorgeous, with long dark hair and the most amazing figure. She was just chatting with me at the counter, asking about different cuts of meat, and I couldn't help but be mesmerized. I had to have her. So I invited her to the back, same as always. And when we got back there, I pulled out my knife. But as I went to make the kill, she suddenly turned and saw what I was about to do. Her eyes went wide with terror, and she started screaming and begging for her life. I panicked. I couldn't have her drawing attention, so I quickly overpowered her and slashed her throat with the razor-sharp blade. The force of the blow nearly decapitated her, and blood sprayed out in a violent torrent. I watched dispassionately as the light slowly faded from her eyes, my hands steady despite the adrenaline coursing through me. Once she had stopped moving, I got to work on the gruesome task of dismembering the body. As I was cutting her up, I noticed something strange. There was a large, thick scar running down her abdomen. I realized then that this poor girl must have been some kind of medical experiment or something. Maybe an organ donor, or a victim of some kind of black market surgery. I felt a pang of guilt, but I couldn't just let all that good meat go to waste. So I finished butchering her body and packaged it all up, just like the others. I even made some extra fine sausage from her, knowing it would be a real treat for my customers. Business continued to boom after that. I was raking in more cash than I knew what to do with and no one was the wiser about my little side operation. I felt untouchable. Over the next year, I continued to target select customers, carefully choosing my victims and disposing of the bodies in creative ways to avoid detection. I even started branching out, using some of my profits to invest in a few rental properties. That way, if anything ever did come back to the shop, I'd have a nice little nest egg to fall back on. As the money started rolling in, I couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction. Sure, what I was doing was morally reprehensible, but I was getting away with it, and it was making me richer than I ever could have imagined. I knew that eventually, the law might catch up with me, but for now, I was living the high life. I had a thriving business a growing real estate portfolio, and the best damn sausage recipe in town. And no one was ever the wiser. Story number three. It all started about a year ago, when my family moved to this new town. We've been moving around a lot the past few years, always to a different state. My parents say it's for work, but I'm starting to think there's more to it. I was never really the popular kid in school. I had a few friends here and there, but I was always the quiet, awkward one. When we moved to this town, I didn't even bother trying to make new friends. What was the point if we were just going to end up leaving again in a year or two? So I found myself spending a lot of time online, browsing forums and chatting with strangers. That's where I stumbled upon something that would change my life forever. It started on one of those dark web forums. The kind where people share the most messed up stuff you can imagine. I was just bored, scrolling through when I came across a post that caught my eye. It was a video titled Basement Butcher's Raw Footage. Curiosity got the better of me, and I clicked on it. The video quality was pretty poor but I could make out two figures in the dimly lit basement. They were wearing clown masks and seemed to be scalping a man. I felt my stomach lurch as I watched them cut his scalp off and then gouge out his eyes. Once he was dead, they just tossed his body into a pit 
where I could see the silhouettes of pigs swarming over it. I stared at the screen in horror, my heart pounding. Who the hell were these people? And why the hell was this video even on the internet? I felt nauseous, but I couldn't look away. After that first video, I found more posts from the same user, all with similar gruesome footage. Each time, the victims were different, but the MO was the same. The two clown masked killers would torture and mutilate their victims before disposing of the bodies. I should have turned it off, closed my laptop, and never thought about it again. But I couldn't. I was morbidly fascinated. I had to know more. Over the next few weeks, I spent hours scouring those forums, looking for any information I could find on the basement butchers. The more I learned, the more my stomach twisted in knots. It turned out these videos had been posted by an anonymous user who claimed to have stumbled upon the footage by accident. They said it was recorded in the basement of a house in a small town and that the killers had been operating there for years, murdering anyone who wandered too close to their home. The user said they were too afraid to go to the police, fearing the killers would come after them. Instead, they were just spreading the videos online in the hopes that someone else would see them and take action. I felt sick to my stomach as I read through all the disturbing details. Who could be capable of such horrific acts? And how had they avoided getting caught for so long? Then, one day, I made a connection that made my blood run cold. The town, the user described. It sounded an awful lot like the town we had just moved to. And the more I thought about it, the more things started to add up. My parents had been acting really strange lately. Secretive, jumpy, always on edge. They seemed to be constantly looking over their shoulders, like they were afraid of something. And we had moved here so suddenly, with no warning, just picking up and leaving our old home behind. Could it be possible that? No, I couldn't even bring myself to finish the thought. There was no way my parents could be involved in something like that. They were good, kind people. Upstanding members of the community. They wouldn't. They couldn't. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that all the signs were there. The frequent moves. The paranoia. The way they always seemed to have plenty of money despite my dad's modest job. It all started to make a horrifying kind of sense. I felt like I was going to throw up. My own parents. Serial killers. It was too much to wrap my head around. I tried to convince myself that I was just being paranoid, that I was reading too much into things. But deep down, I knew the truth. I had to know for sure. So one day, when my parents were both at work, I decided to investigate. I went down to the basement fully expecting to find it locked up tight. But to my surprise, the door was unlocked. Slowly, I pushed it open and made my way down the creaky wooden stairs. As I reached the bottom, I immediately noticed two things. The strong stench of bleach and the eerie silence. There was something off about this place, something unsettling. I took a few tentative steps forward my heart pounding in my ears. That's when I saw them. Hanging on the wall, two clown masks, identical to the ones I had seen in the videos. I froze, my breath catching in my throat. This couldn't be happening. It had to be some kind of sick joke or a terrible misunderstanding. There was no way my parents were. My gaze drifted around the dimly lit basement taking in the various tools and equipment stored there. Suddenly, my eyes landed on a deep pit in the far corner, partially obscured by a tarp. A shiver ran down my spine as I realized it looked exactly like the pit from the videos, the one where the victim's bodies were dumped. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't think. All I could do was stare in horrified disbelief at the mounting evidence that my parents were. 
No, I refuse to believe it. There had to be some other explanation. I quickly made my way back upstairs, my legs trembling beneath me. I had to get out of that basement, away from those damning clues. As I emerged into the sunlight, I felt a wave of nausea wash over me. I stumbled to the bathroom, barely making it to the toilet before I retched violently. My mind was racing, trying to process what I had just seen. This couldn't be real. It had to be some kind of twisted nightmare. But deep down, I knew the truth. My parents were the basement butchers. The very people I had spent weeks searching for online were the same ones who had raised me, who I had trusted my entire life. I sank to the floor, my entire body shaking. I felt like I was going to pass out. How could this be happening? What was I supposed to do now? Part of me wanted to confront my parents, to demand the truth. But the rational part of my brain knew that would be incredibly dangerous. If they really were the killers, they wouldn't hesitate to silence me too. I had to get out of here had to get as far away from them as possible. But where could I go? Who would even believe me? I was just some awkward teenager with a wild story about his serial killer parents. As I sat there, trying to calm my racing heart, a thought occurred to me. The videos. If I could somehow get those videos to the police, maybe they could investigate and finally bring my parents to justice. With shaking hands, I pulled out my phone and started searching for the forum posts. I had to hurry before my parents got home. I had to do something, anything, to stop them from killing again. As I scrolled through the forum, my heart sank. The posts were all gone. The user who had uploaded the videos had deleted their account. I frantically searched for any other traces of the footage, but it was like it had been wiped from the internet. I let out a frustrated cry, slamming my phone down on the bathroom floor. I was so close, and now the evidence was gone. I was running out of time. Suddenly, I heard the sound of a car pulling into the driveway. My parents were home. I scrambled to my feet, my mind racing. I had to think of something, and fast. Without even thinking, I rushed to my room and started packing a bag. I had to get out of here, had to get as far away from my parents as possible. I didn't know where I was going or what I was going to do, but I knew I couldn't stay here. As I was shoving clothes into my backpack, I heard the front door open. My heart pounded in my chest as I listened to the sound of my parents' voices, laughing and chatting as they made their way inside. I froze my body going rigid with fear. What if they came up here and saw me packing? They'd know something was wrong. They'd know that I knew. I took a deep breath, trying to steady my nerves. I had to stay calm, had to act normal. I zipped up my bag and tossed it under my bed, just as I heard footsteps on the stairs. Honey, are you up there? My mom called out. We're home. I, yeah, I'm here, I managed to say, cursing the way my voice shook. Well, come on down. We've got a surprise for you. A surprise? My stomach churned with dread. What kind of surprise could they possibly have in store for me? Slowly, I made my way downstairs, my legs feeling like jelly. As I entered the living room, I saw my parents standing there grinning from ear to ear. What's going on? I asked, trying to keep my tone casual. Well, we've got some great news. My dad exclaimed, we're moving again. I felt my heart drop. Moving again? Of course. How could I have been so stupid? They were running, trying to stay one step ahead of the law. Where this time? I asked barely above a whisper. Oh, you're going to love it, my mom said, practically bouncing with excitement. It's a beautiful little town, nice and quiet. Perfect for us to start over. 
Start over. The words sent a chill down my spine. How many times had they started over now, leaving a trail of bodies in their wake? I felt like I was going to be sick again. I had to get out of here. Had to get away from them before they... You know. When are we leaving? I ask, trying to keep my voice steady. As soon as possible, my dad said. We've already got the house all lined up. We're gonna start packing up tomorrow. Tomorrow, I didn't have much time. I had to act fast. Had to find a way to stop them before they could disappear again. That's... that's great, I managed to say, forcing a smile. I'm... uh... I'm gonna go finish up some homework, okay? Without waiting for a response, I turned and practically ran back upstairs. Once I was safely in my room, I sank down onto my bed, my head in my hands. I couldn't believe this was happening. My own parents, serial killers. It was like something out of a horror movie, but this was real. They were real, and they were coming for me. I had to do something, but what? The videos were gone. The evidence was gone. Who would even believe me at this point? I was just a scared kid, up against two experienced, ruthless murderers. As I sat there, trying to figure out my next move, I heard a noise from the hallway. Slowly, I lifted my head, my heart pounding in my chest. There, standing in the doorway, was my mom. She was looking at me with an expression I couldn't quite place. A mix of concern and something else. Honey. Are you okay? She asked, her voice soft. You've been up here for a while. I was starting to get worried. I stared at her, my mouth suddenly dry. I'm fine, I croaked out. Just tired, that's all. She nodded, but the look on her face told me she didn't believe me. Well, if you need anything, you know your father and I are here for you, right? I nodded weakly my stomach churning. Yeah, I know. She hesitated for a moment, then stepped forward and placed a hand on my shoulder. We're going to be so happy in our new home, sweetie. You'll see. It's going to be a fresh start for all of us. A fresh start. I shuddered at the thought. For them, it would be a chance to continue their horrific killing spree. But for me, I felt the panic welling up inside me, threatening to consume me. I couldn't breathe, couldn't think. All I could see were those clown masks, those empty eye sockets, those lifeless bodies. Suddenly, I knew what I had to do. I had to get out of here, had to get as far away from my parents as possible. But I couldn't just leave, not without trying to stop them. I had to call the police. I had to tell them everything, show them the evidence, even if it meant risking my own life. I couldn't let my parents hurt anyone else, not if I could help it. With trembling hands, I reached for my phone, ignoring my mom's concerned questions. I had to do this, no matter how scared I was. As I dialed the number, I could feel my heart pounding in my ears. This was it, the moment of truth. I took a deep breath and pressed the call button, praying that someone would believe me. The phone rang once, twice, three times. Just as I was about to give up, a voice answered on the other end. 911, what's your emergency? I opened my mouth, the words spilling out in a rushed, panicked torrent. My parents. They're, they're serial killers. I found videos of them of them killing people. They have to be stopped. Please, you have to help me. There was a brief pause on the other end of the line, and then the operator spoke again, her voice calm and steady. Okay, sir, I need you to stay on the line and tell me everything you know. We're going to send someone to your location right away. As I started to explain everything, from the videos to the clues I had found in the basement, I could hear the sound of my parents' voices from downstairs. 
They were coming up the stairs, their footsteps growing louder with each passing second. I knew I was running out of time. I had to keep talking, had to convince the operator that I was telling the truth. But the panic was setting in, making it harder and harder to form coherent thoughts. Suddenly, I heard my bedroom door creak open, and I spun around to see my parents standing there, their faces twisted into expressions of fury. What have you done? My dad growled, his voice low and menacing. I felt my blood run cold, the phone slipping from my trembling fingers. This was it, the end. They were going to kill me, just like they had killed all those others. I could hear the operator's voice calling out, asking if I was still there, but it was too late. As my parents advanced towards me, I knew there was no escape. I was trapped, and I was about to pay the ultimate price for uncovering their dark secret. In that moment, I realized that my parents had been right all along. We had to keep moving, had to stay one step ahead of the law. Because the truth was, they were monsters, and they would stop at nothing to protect their twisted, murderous way of life. As the realization hit me, I felt a wave of panic wash over me. I couldn't breathe, couldn't think. All I could do was stare at my parents, my heart pounding in my chest as they closed in on me, their hands outstretched, their eyes filled with a chilling, murderous intent. And then everything went black. This is the curator. I hope you've enjoyed today's scary stories. Until next time.